how to curtail down uh, the timing of our presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Good afternoon, sir. sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hmm. Is my voice is audible to you? Yes, yes. Um, madam, shall I share? Ma'am, I'll share from my side. You just explain. Uh, Yes, ma'am. Please start. Ma'am, it is not visible yet. Other participants? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you can see. Visible. Yes. Visible, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Shall I start, ma'am? Yes, yes madam. You can start. Yes, yes. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Respected all the dignitaries of HRDC, RTM Nagpur University, respected Dr. Nitin Dungarwar sir, Dr. Preeti Tharmik madam, and all participants. I'm Dr. Aparna Kurse from Shankara Lagwa Science College. Today I'm presenting my seminar and the topic is Vermicos. So the first question comes to our mind, what is Vermicos? Madam, next slide. हेलो मैम स्लाइड चेंज के लिए है वर्मी कंपोस्टिंग प्रैक्टिसेस ओके 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 सो what is worm compost? It is a method of preparing compost with the use of earthworm. So it is the one of the easiest method to recycle all the agriculture waste. What is the difference between the regular compost and the worm compost? That is the here in this process we are using worm. And nowadays compost is becoming popular and the major component of organic farming. Worm compost is consistent of fine granule or organic manure which enhance the quality of soil by improving its physiochemical as well as biological properties. What exactly happens in the compost? Earthworm consume this biomass and excrete in digestive form. This digestive or the excreta of the earthworm is called worm cast and popularly it is called black gold. Next, next ma'am. Yes, why we are learning uh, some compost because it is strictly organic in nature and it can be used as organic fertilizer. It enriches the soil and create an ecological safe environment for the production of food as well as it helps in the raising the fertility and the productivity of land. And it also avoids the harmful effects of chemical fertilizer, pesticides, insecticides. Next one. Now, what are the materials we need in vermicompost? Basically, three things we need. Organic waste, cow dung, and earthworm. 
so what is our waste in that we can use as excreta kitchen waste fruit waste farm waste even forest litter can also be used as a key raw material next ma'am now everybody know what is the characteristics of earthworm here icenia fortifica is best suitable worm we are using in vermicompost as we all know earthworm creeps on the ground they usually live inside the soil they eat insects plant in the soil and they easily mix up the soil while moving through it they make holes and these holes are very useful to provide air and water which is easily the roots of the plant that's why uh, this earthworm is very useful in vermicompost next ma'am yes not all the worms are suitable for vermicompost we have selected this red wiggler why because it has the high multiplication rate that's why it is very suitable for this job next now what is the process of vermicompost so depending upon the amount of the production and the composted structure we have small scale production and large scale production so if a farmer need a, a personal requirement he can do small scale production where he can harvest 5 to 2 tons of vermicompost annually and as far as the commercial purpose large scale production can also be done there are basically two methods among them uh, various method among them bed method and pit method are very common in vermicompost now what is bed method in this method composting is done on kachcha and pakka floor and uh, this method is very easy to maintain and practice next in pit method composting is in cemented pit and the whole unit is covered with the Uh, raw materials this method is usually not preferred because due to the poor aeration and water logging problem we have seen at the bottom and it is cost wise it is also uh, very costly to prepare a pit so it is little bit uh, costly as compared to the bed method next now these are the following steps which we had to remember vermi compost can be done in order to done the vermi compost we need to select coal moist and steady site that is the place and uh, in the ratio 3 is to 1 we need a slurry of cow dung uh, where cow dung is of three part and one part of uh, crop residue then after of this mixture is uh, placed and kept in as a bedding material at the bottom of the bed and a red earth worm should be released on the upper layer of the bed as soon as the red uh, earth worm was released water is uh, given to the bed next bed should be moist by sprinkling of water and by covering with gunny bags bed should be turned once after 30 days that means we need to mix it well so that whatever the compound uh, com component present inside that uh, they they can mix with uh, each other after 45 to 50 days compost get ready and the finished product we are getting that is 3/4 of the raw material which we have used next ma'am these are the photo see uh, this is the earthworm and this is the material which we get next ma'am in this way we need to water the beds and in order to uh, keep it moist we need to cover with gunny bags next next ma'am so finally you can see that from the uh, agriculture waste kitchen waste we get the uh, black gold worm cast next ma'am 
so once the black uh, granular compost is uh, prepared we need to harvest it and watering should be stopped at that time the compost should be kept over a heap of partial decomposed uh, cow dung so that the earthworm could migrate to the cow dung from the compost and after two days we can easily separate and sieve for the use of vermicompost next ma'am so these are the nutrient analysis we very well know that worm compost is in all nutrient next ma'am now what are the preventive measures we we, we uh, going to uh, take during the worm compost that we should uh, take care of, that there is, should not be a pre, uh, earthworm migration and uh, uh, we should use uh, cow dung which is of old that means we cannot able to use fresh cow dung because there is too much uh, heat along with that we have to take care that organic paste should be free from plastic chemical pesticides and other metal aeration should be maintained hence we need to turn or we need to mix the uh, compost uh, compost every time so that the multiplication of earthworm will be possible as well as optimum temperature we should maintain that is between 30 to 40 uh, uh, optimum moisture sorry that is the humidity between 30 to 40 percentage and uh, temperature should be maintained between 18 to 25 degrees Celsius for proper decomposition of agricultural waste. Next, ma'am. Now, as we know, the benefits of vermicompost. Next, ma'am. This is the in America, in America grow away 96 billion pounds of food. So, here we can convert food waste into the fertilizer by using this vermicompost. Uh, 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 Along with that, we should also know that it restores the fertility of soil and we can also avoid the harmful, harmful effects of chemical fertilizer too. Along with that, next ma'am. Along with that, other benefits are there. We are putting waste and we are getting gold as an output. So, uh, waste out of best is another concept we are using here. Use of chemical fertilizer is very costly with respect to the money. So, use of vermicompost save money of the farmers. It also help, uh, help in reducing land pollution because we are using waste. It also help in rearing of earthworm which... Uh, ultimately promote animal husbandry it also reduces population of pathogenic microorganism toxic uh, toxicity Madam, of heavy metal which ultimately in, uh, yeah please stick yes, to time this is, the, this is the last slide so we ultimately secure the health so thus i have to say the concluding remark here that vermicompost is economically viable and uh, uh, safe and very low cost technology for that we have uh, established vermicompost pit at our college and organized one day workshop on vermicompost that we can promote our student to adopt this technology and to promote this technology i hope i make you understand the topic and if you have any query you can ask thank you I took all thank the references you, from Google. Okay, uh -huh. I took uh, all the references from the Google. Thank you for your presence. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, we will not take questions today because we are already short of time. So we will not take the questions. Okay. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kunal, sir. Yes, madam. Uh, good afternoon, respected Dr. Uh, Dongarwar sir and uh, Dharmik madam and Alok you. Uh, my voice is audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I am Dr. I am Dr. Kunal Lakshman Trukman, Assistant Professor, SES College, Kinodi. Uh, Taluka Shahapur District Thane, 
my research seminar uh, topic is study on diversity of rhizosphere mycoflora of some medicinal plant in nandir district this is my phd topic uh, next madam slide uh, this is my outline of research work introduction importance of rhizosphere mycoflora material and methods experimental result conclusion and references next slide introduction of rhizosphere uh, right, uh, the term rhizosphere was first introduced by Hitler in 1904. The definition of the rhizosphere, the region of the soil immediately surrounding the region uh, of the root of the plant together with the root surface. Uh, rhizosphere, uh, rhizosphere soil organism consists of the microflora like the fungi, bacteria, actinomyces. Uh, the rhizosphere is the dynamic zone of the microbial activity. It is a highly favorable habitat for the activity and metabolism of all the microorganisms. Next slide. Uh, importance of the rhizosphere microflora. The microflora, an important component of the soil. Microflora to improve the plant growth and development. Uh, microflora to increase the soil fertility. Uh, they improve the soil environmental condition. Uh, they play a role in the decomposition of the organic matter and plant uh, nutrient availability. The fungal diversity is a great source of the medicine like the secondary metabolites. Uh, next, uh, aims and objective of my research uh, uh, to isolation and identification of the rhizosphere microflora of selected medicinal plant on the basis of the morphological and uh, dominant species on the molecular level identification. Next. Next, madam. Material and method. Uh, I selected uh, selected of the medicinal plant for the rhizosphere. Uh, selected Nanda district region. Uh, the sample were collected from the village of the Siddhanath, uh, situated on the uh, bank of the river Godavari, five kilometer uh, from the away uh, Nanda district. The uh, four medicinal plants were selected for the rhizosphere: Mycoplora, Alenium, Solifolium, Santum album. Dalbergia, Shisho, and Laminaria, uh, Lamino Acidisma. These are the four uh, plants were selected. Uh, materials and uh, material used for the isolation of the rhizosphere uh, of the sample of medicinal plants for the isolation of the microflora. Identification of the plants. Identification uh, key flora sketches, mobile uh, mobile application, uh, uh, Google Lens, and relevant literature. Uh, flora of Marathwada were extensively used for the identification of the plants. Next, uh, isolation of the rhizosphere, uh, my, um, rhizospheric fungi. This is the protocol uh, used for the isolation of the rhizospheric fungi. 10 gram of the uh, rhizospheric microflora plus uh, 90 ml of the distilled water in the uh, beaker containing 0.85% of the NaCl. Uh, shake well for the 50 minutes on the magnetic shaker. Uh, prepare serial dilution uh, by uh, 10 to minus power uh, 2 to 10 to minus power 5 uh, and spread on the uh, on uh, uh, 0 0.1 uh, ml of the each dilution on the petri uh, plate containing molten uh, 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 agar PDA incubated at the room temperature for the 48 hours in inverted position. Finally, number were counted daily uh, observed. Next. Uh, staining and uh, mounting of the uh, fungi, isolated fungi were mounted in the lactophenol and cotton blue for the identify on the basis of the asexual, uh, asexual sexual spore and fruiting structure, microscopic observation and macroscopic observation, uh, uh, conidia, uh, conidia for and conidia photography was done under the microscope of the trial Lambert microscope, uh, percents of the incidence, number of the colony, uh, of a particular species uh, div divided by total number of the colony of all the species multiplied and hundreds. This is the formula used for the percent incident. This is the uh, photograph of the um, uh, microscopic. Uh, this is the photograph of the fungal plates, uh, and it is a, a slant of the culture uh, fungi. Next, this is the microscopic photograph of the isolated uh, 31 fungal species. Next slide. Molecular identification of the isolated uh, isolated uh, fungal species. 
I have isolated uh, four uh, 31 fungal species, but dominant four fungal species were uh, identified on the basis of the uh, 18S, uh, 18S uh, RNA sequencing. Uh, the, this is the area five first, uh, second, uh, third, and fourth. Aspergillus trimary, uh, Telluromyces funiculus, Penicillium hericu, Aspergillus uh, uh, trimary is the second. The molecular uh, identification of the Aspergillus trimary uh, with uh, 213 base pair, uh, pair showed a 64 similarity with the Aspergillus. Uh, and Telluromyces uh, funiculus uh, 254 base uh, pair showed a 100% similarity with the Penicillium funiculus Penicillium hericu uh, with the 192 base pair uh, uh, sequencing uh, which uh, showed 100% similarity where the Aspergillus trimary um, uh, uh, B uh, with the 220 base pair showed a 64 similarity of the Aspergillus facie. Uh, next, madam. Uh, this is the RNA sequences uh, of the RFI of the medicinal plants uh, with known sequencing of the NCBI uh, database RFI first, RFI second, RFI third, and RFI fourth. Next, uh, this is the phylogenetic uh, tree of the uh, RFI of medicinal plant. Phylogenetic tree, uh, Aspergillus trimary. Uh, uh, in the figure, it is a clear. Here that the phylogenetic tree of the RFI first Aspergillus trimary first uh, showed 64 similarity with Aspergillus species um, and second uh, RFI second uh, it show in the uh, uh, figure it is a clear that phylogenetic tree of the RFI second Telluromyces funiculus uh, show the 100 percent similar with the Penicillium funiculus. Next, madam. Uh, Phylogenetic tree uh, of RFI third. Uh, it is a clear uh, that the phylogenetic tree of the RFI third uh, Penicillium hericu showed the hundred percent similarity with the Penicillium hericu. Uh, RFI uh, fourth. It is a clear that the phylogenetic tree, tree of the RFI four Aspergillus trimary B showed hundred percent uh, sixty four sorry sixty four similarity with the Aspergillus uh, species bearing accession number. DQ 9936484. Uh, uh, Next, madam. Conclusion of the my uh, research work. Conclusion of the uh, my research work. Uh, this is the four uh, plants uh, where you, you extensively used use for the isolation of the rhizospheric fungi. Uh, there are the total 31 fungal species were isolated and identified. The four dominant fungal species were identified on the molecular level. Uh, for uh, the RFI, we are identified on the basis of the molecular level. Uh, the uh, Aspergillus trimary first, uh, uh, Tyloromyces funiculus, Penicillium hericu, and Aspergillus uh, trimary B uh, used for um, ID, uh, molecular identification. Next. Uh, this is the references for the uh, use for the my research topic. Thank you, Clark. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Next one is Miss Sartaj. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm here. Uh, ma'am, uh, which I have submitted today, uh, that slide should be displayed, ma'am. Yes, yes. Mm. Today is 14th here. Yeah. Yes, can you see? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, please start. Yes, Good afternoon, all. I'm Sartaj Sheikh from Gram Gita Mahavidal Chimur, and my topic is Moon Dust Carnation. I'm next. Ma'am, uh, moon dust carnation is the improved horticulture variety. Um, next, please. Ornamental uh, floriculture is becoming an important industry. As we know, flowers are inseparable elements of all the occasions from uh, birth to the end of our life. 
ornamentals include a large variety of crop plants such as cut flowers bulbs and combs flowering pot plants and foliage plants etc for a modern and in industrialized horticulture there is always demand or and necessity for new varieties am um, next the top selling cut flowers species like rose chrysanthemum carnations and lily species that occupy more than 50% of cut flower market but these lack delphinidin based anthocyanin and this because they they have deficiency of flavonoid 3,5 hydroxylase gene and because of this the gene has attracted considerable attention as a critical molecular tool to in uh, engineer blue for, uh, flower color in this species using recombinant dna technology ma'am next please these are the carnation flowers uh, the, uh, scientifically uh, carnation is known as dianthus caryophyllus and uh, we can see here in different shades uh, which are na uh, occurring naturally ma'am next carnations are one of the most extensively grown cut flowers in the world most preferred flower for commercial purpose because of their extens uh, excellent keeping quality withstand in long distance transportation and remarkable quality to uh, rehydrate europe usa uh cultivates the crop on large area whereas the in india it is cultivated on smaller scale himachal pradesh punjab west bengal jammu and kashmir and karnataka are major carnation producing states flowers flowers come in different shades like uh, white yellow pink red and orange etc and uh, red and pink carnations uh, generally accumulate uh, flavonoids and anthocyanins derivatives such as cyanidin and uh, pelargonidin but lacks delphinidin which uh, uh, gives blue color ma'am next this one is the petunia flower uh, representing the blue color ma'am next uh, from petunia uh, the scientists isolated the um, enzyme which is uh, enzymatically um, forming the delphinidin uh, pigment which is blue in color and uh, that was done in the year 1992 and after that uh, after uh, after uh, some years uh, they have introduced it in carnation also mundus carnation uh, was the first grown commercially in 1996 is a mini carnation with purple mop flower that gets its blue color from petunia genes as i said earlier and grafted uh, into the dna of carnation these carnations genetically modified by the australian company called florigan and these are the um, flower range uh, which florigan company uh, florigan company have developed till date uh with uh, the name uh, prefix by the moon flower color is uh, mainly due to the classes of pigment flavonoids carotenoids and betalins among them uh, a colored class flavonoids uh, anthocyanin confers a diverse range of flower from orange to red to violet and blue um next please now how uh, they have engineered this uh, the most 
common type of flower pigment uh, are anthocyanin a group of flavonoids uh, they are synthesized by a series of reactions starting from the amino acid phenylalanine uh, the color of the flower is dependent on the chemical nature and anthocyanin produced and also uh, it depends on the ph of vacuole also and uh, by uh, the process of uh, anthocyanin uh, biosynthesis pelar coordinating three glucoside uh, is produced uh, which uh, gives brick red or orange color and cyanidin uh, three glucoside gives red color and delphinidin three glucoside uh, produces blue or two purple colors ma'am next this uh, one is the uh, biosynthetic pathway for the anthocyanin pigments different pigments and uh, different enzymes after formation of uh, dihydrochemphorol uh, works uh, differently on the dihydrochemphorol and produces different coloration just uh, for example pelargonidin 3 glucoside and uh, cyanidin and delphinidin for the de uh, delphinidin production there is requirement of flavonoid 3 5 hydroxylase which lacks in uh, carnation and uh, roses lilies and chrysanthemum uh, so scientists uh, introduced that uh, flavonoid 3 5 hydroxylase gene into the carnations and produced uh, a series of carnations uh, various shades of carnations ma'am next Ma'am, next. Yes, ma'am, changed. Okay. And be faster. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, next again. Okay. Uh, this one is the. Um, time uh, where, uh, 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 periods when uh, they have modified the carnations and uh, approximately 11 different shades uh, they have given it yes ma'am these are the references and uh, that's all for uh, uh, seminar topic thank you ma'am next okay. thank you dr sartash ma'am thank you yes Uh, Dr. Vikas Mohuture, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Um, yesterday, I have sent um, Yes. Yes, sir. Please start. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes. Respected Dr. Dongarwat, sir. Respected Sikhi Dharmik, ma'am. And all the fellow participants over here. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's my seminar topic is Defense Mechanism in Plant Against Pathogen. Next, ma'am. So pathogen is any biological agent like bacteria, viruses, they are responsible for causing the diseases in many plants. So what plant provides uh, to, the, to this pathogen? Plant actually the rich source of nutrient and that's why this type of pathogen may attack the plant. So plant lack the immune system as comparable to, comparable to the animals, but plants have developed stunning array of structural chemical and protein based defense design to detect the invading organism and stop them before they are able to cause the extent to damage. Next one. So this defense mechanism can be classified into two main types. One is the structural defense mechanism and next one is the biochemical defense mechanism. So structural defense mechanism again can be classified into the pre-existing structural defense and after the infection it again develops certain 
structural uh, characters. And in biochemical defense also, there is a pre-existing biochemical structures or biochemical formation is there and post-infectional defense mechanism developed in, in plants. Next ma'am. So, in the structural defense mechanism, actually surface of the plant or the host is the first line of defense against the pathogen. Pathogen must adhere to the surface and penetrate, so it is to cause the infection. So, if the structure of the plant defend the pathogen, then that pathogen unable to enter inside the plant. So, next ma'am. So, plant itself has, ma'am, next please. So, plant itself has certain structural, pre-existing structural uh, defense character or structure like the wax and the cuticle, shape and size and location of the natural opening like stomata and lenticels and presence of the thick wall tissues uh, of the plant that hinder the advance of the pathogen. So, wax is the mixture of long chain apolar lipid and it forms the protective coating on the plants, leaves and fruit and it is hydrophobic in nature and it prevents the entry of the pathogen. Next ma'am. So, the another important, next ma'am please. So, another important thing is there, the cuticle in uh, ma'am back, back one please. So, cuticle uh, in most of the case, uh, the cuticle is present on the upper epidermis. So, uh, in the upper epidermis, uh, harder enough, thick enough, so that the entry of the pathogen may be prevented. Apart from that, epidermis can also act as a barrier or we can say that also act as a, uh, act, uh, means it prevent the entry of the pathogen. So, in case of uh, Puccinia gramini PTC, actually it enters the barberry plant through the uh, particularly through the cuticle and through the epidermal layer. But this barberry plant can protect themselves by secreting the tough cuticle and that's why in most of the cases the barberry plant do not get suffer from such a type of Puccinia species. Next ma'am. So, next ma'am please. The another type of structural defense is the clearenchyma cell. It is composed of a thick wall lignin and uh, it may act as a, it, it, uh, it is brittle, uh, it helps in the mechanical support of the uh, plant. Uh, next one is the uh, structure of the natural opening. So, as we know, stomata is mostly uh, responsible for the exchange of the gases, but the uh, entry of the pathogen may get prevented by the uh, stomata in some pathogen like the rust of feet can enter the stomata only enters to the stomata only when the stomata are open. The structure of the pro stomata prevent the resistance of the penetration by certain plant pathogenic uh, fungi. In case of Puccinia gramini again, the structure of the stomata prevent the entry of this Puccinia inside the wheat, wheat plant. Next ma'am. Next ma'am, please. So, the another opening is there, lenticels. So, lenticels are the opening on the fruit, stem, tuber. They are filled with the loosely connected cell that allow the passage of the air. The shape and the internal structure of the lenticel can increase or incidence of the fruit diseases. So, one of the pathogen, uh, like the potato, uh, it is the streptomyces cabbage, which enters to the lenticel, try to enter to the lenticel, but uh, this potato plant, prevent them from uh, entering to this uh, lenticel. Next, next, next please. Another one is the post-infectional or induced structural defense. As uh, if the entry of the pathogen takes place, then after the entry of the pathogen, still the plant protect themselves by, by forming the uh, another level that is the post-infectional or induced structural defense. So, a uh, pathogen penetrate to the host surface, induce the structural defense mechanism in the host cell, and they may be a certain different types of barriers. Next, ma'am. Like the cork layer, abscisal layer, and pyrogis formation. Next, next, please. So, it is the cork layer. 
uh, if the infection by the pathogen uh, bacteria some viruses and nematode in uh, takes place in the plant then there is a formation of the layer beyond the infection so this cork cell inhibit the further invasion beyond the initial layer next ma'am so if you see madam next slide please So, if you see this diagram, you can easily observe that there is a formation of the cork layer after the infection. So, that entry of the pathogen inside the uh, next tissue gets here stopped due to the formation of the cork layer. Next, please. So, another is the abscision layer. So, an abscision layer consists of a gap formed between the infected and the healthy cell of the leaf surrounding the uh, lo locus of the infection. So, this abscision layer, again, it forms after the infection. So, due to the disintegration of the middle lamella or the parenchymatous tissue, the infected area gets shivel, dies and slogs off, carrying with the pathogen and it prevents the entry of the pathogen in the next level. Next, ma'am. So, if you see this diagram, so there is a disease area lignified cell and after the disease area, there is a formation of the abscision layer. So, when the abscision layer is formed, then this uh, disease area gets shriveled off and the rest of the area gets protected. So, in this way, this abscision layer may protect the or protect the plant from getting entry of the pathogen. Next one. Again, there is a formation of the tylogies. So, tylogies are the outgrowth of the protoplast of the adjacent uh, living parenchymatous cell which is protected into the xylem vessel through the pits. Next, ma'am. So, next, next. So, see here in the diagram, you can easily observe that there is a formation of the tight layer of the tylogies which prevent the entry of the pathogen. Next, please. Then again, in certain plants, there is a formation of the gum. So, various types of gums are produced in, by many plants around the lesion after the infection by the pathogen or the in, injury. So, gum secretion is most common in stone fruit trees, but occurs in most of the plants. These gum are exuded by the plant under the stress condition and it protects the entry of the pathogen in the next level. Next one. So, up to this we see about the, we saw about the different structural defense character. Now, when the plant, when the pathogen gets entry inside the plant, then there is a, again there is a biochemical defense mechanism. But still the plant have certain pre-existing chemical defense and certain chemical may form after the infection. So, plant itself have phenolics tan, like tanning, glucanase, dyes and chitinase are there. And after the infection, there is a formation of uh, certain phytoalexin planty bodies. And in most of the cases, there is a formation of the hypersensitivity reaction. Oh, we will see one by one. Next, ma'am. So, in the pre existing chemical defense, there are certain chemicals like phenolics, uh, it is uh, generally found in the onion. So, tannin is there, and some fatty acids uh, like compounds are there, uh, which are present in high concentration in the cell of the young fruit uh, leaves and seed, which uh, these compounds uh, are the potent inhibitors of many hydrolytic enzymes uh, that it prevent the entry of the pathogen, uh, means itself plant have this type of uh, particular uh, chemicals. Next ma'am. So another chemical is the saponin, it have the antifungal or membranolytic uh, activities, lectins are there. They are the proteins bind specifically, specifically to the certain sugar and occurs in the large concentration in many types of seed. Certain hydrolytic enzymes are there like uh, glucanase, chitinase, etc. Next, ma'am. Uh, then certain induced chemical defense mechanism Sir, is kindly there. Sir, kindly sum up your seminar. Sir, kindly yes, sum yes, up. Last two slides, ma'am. Yes. So, yes, yes, ma'am. Last two slides, ma'am. So, this is the phytoelexin. Phytoelexin are the toxic antimicrobial substance which produce after the infection. Next, ma'am. So, 
plantar bodies are there it is generally the antibodies of the plant we can say it it is encoded by the animal gene but produced in and by the plant so they are called plantar body transgenic plants have uh, certain types of this character uh, in which they this uh, particular pathogen can be uh, stopped uh, through these plantar bodies next one last one so hypersensitivity reaction is there this uh, hypersensitivity is the localized induced cell death in the host plant at the site of infection by the pathogen thus limiting the growth of pathogen so hypersensitivity reaction occurs only in the incompatible host pathogen condition and this hypersensitivity reaction again can again stop the entry of the pathogen in the next layer next ma'am so these are my references so thank you for patience listening thank you dongarwar sir thank you priti ma'am and thank you all the participants thank you very much thank you thank you dr vikas sir thank you ma'am next one is dr vinod chauhan sir dr vinod chauhan sir hello ha sir hello i am audible madam yes yes thank you madam uh, good afternoon to one and all uh, dr respected dongara sir uh, priti madam and my dear participants my sir vinod nursing chauhan assistant professor department of botany arts commerce and science college marigaon and uh, my seminar topic is uh, nutritional potential of ficus racemosa fruits next madam friends ficus racemosa fruits is uh, sorry ficus racemosa is a plants uh, member from family moriaceae and this is a common uh, known as a cluster fig red river uh, fig guller Odumber and umber. It is mostly found along the streams and river banks. Also cultivated in a house yards and temple premises. Ripe receptacles are eaten. Taste like a ficus carica fruits. Unripe receptacle boiled and used for the uh, vegetable preparation. Next, madam. Various parts of plants like uh, bark, leaves, tender shoots, fruits, seeds, and latex are medicinally important. The bark contains tannin, rubber, and wax. Various plant parts are used in diseases of blood, vagina, uterus, leucorrhea, gonorrhea, burning sensation, diarrhea, dysentery, hemorrhoids, and gastrohelicosis. The the bark extract uh, shows anti-hyperglycemic and anti-lipid peroxidative activity uh, activity in diabetic rat rats. The latex is used as an anti-inflammatory and to treat hemorrhages. Next, madam. This is a Uh, a picture shows plant tree next fruits are useful in treatment of dry cough next one uh, loss of voice diseases of kidney and spleen fruits are hypoglycemic and antioxidants the fruit extract is uh, used to treat diabetes leucoderma aphrodisiac monorrhagia and it also used to relieve inflammation of skin wounds and in sprain the extract of bark leaves and fruits are used to anti tumor anti cancer and as a anti microbial agent next madam materials and methods next okay okay thank you for analysis fresh as well as dry material was used in this ash uh, yield was estimated to know the mineral contents uh, the fruits were also tested for the presence of 15 different bioactive compound next madam result and discussion the values of nutrient nutrient and the minerals obtained were converted into the per 100 gram fresh weight of tissue since these fruits are always eaten fresh at uh, table number 1 and table number 2 next madam here 17 phytonutritive elements are estimated in this uh, protein ascorbic acid and carotenoids are mostly uh, uh, mostly uh, found here next madam in a uh, table number 2 12 minerals are estimated here in this the calcium uh, iron uh, sodium uh, potassium and phosphorus are mostly found in this uh, estimation uh, the no uh, the iron and uh, phosphorus is the most uh, very uh, high range of uh, found here next madam according to the gopal et al 
in 2004 has reported the nutritive value of some common Indian foods to understand the nutritional status of the ficus racemus study here. The values obtained here are compared with the values available for three related common fruit species used in Indian diet. Table number three, protein, carotene, ascorbic acid, phosphorus, and iron content of ficus racemus fruit is more than ficus carica, ficus religiosa, and phoenix ductilifera. Uh, next, madam. Here, this shows table number three, the comparison of nutritive contents. In this, the protein, uh, carotenes, ions, and phosphorus are uh, found as compared to the other uh, fruit materials. Now, the next conclusion. From present studies, it is evident that this factor is also not valid for the fruit like fruit. Mineral content was found 2 gram per 100 gram, which is a near about equal to the date and people fix. Calcium was found to be 30.5 gram per 100 gram, which is a more than date. Carbohydrates were found that is a 15.84 gram per 100 gram, which is a near about the similar to the people fix. Ficus racemus of fruit are richer in phosphorus and iron content. The carotene was found to be 200 mu gram per 100 gram, which is a more than ficus carica fruit. Ascorbic acid was found to be 5.3 milligram per 100 gram, which is near about uh, same as that the ficus carica fruit. They are found to contain uh, flavonoids, catechol, uh, triterpenoids, unsaturated steroids, and polyurenoids. Flavonoids and simple phenols like the catechol present in the fruits impart antioxidant property. Presence of unsaturated steroids exhibit strong anti-inflammatory activity. Polyurenoids are uh, Demulcent and emollient richness in phosphorus and iron can make it a good support in the combating anemia. Presence of good amount of carotene and ascorbic acid provides vitamin A and C. Presence of uh, overall the ficus fruits possesses good nutri nutritional potential and uh, should be advocated in addition to the fig uh, and dates. So the purpose of this topic selection is that nowadays the price of dry fruit are rising day by day. We are using dry fruits just like anjir, dates, etc., to pay high amount for purchasing these types of uh, dry fruits. But here the ficus racemus are having the good and equal amount of nutrition. So I think it is a good substitute on a. Uh, on about the dry fruits. That's why I suggest to everyone, you have to use this uh, easily available fruit as a dry fruit in our diet. And that's why I select this topic. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much uh, to giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, UGC HRDC, uh, RTM Nagpur College, uh, Dr. Dongwa sir and uh, Priti madam. Thank you very much madam. Thank you so much sir, nice work, thank you. Next participant, please be ready. I am taking two minutes break. Just two minutes. Yes, next one is Dr. Swapna. Yes, ma'am. Huh. Ma'am, this is the presentation? Yes, ma'am. This yeah. one. Please start. Okay, ma'am. Good afternoon, all of you. Dr. Dongarwar sir, Dr. Preeti Dharmit madam, and all the participants. Myself, Dr. Sapna Karbande, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of Botany, Mahatma Jyotiba Phule Commerce Science and Vitra Raut Arts College, Bhatkuli. Today, I am going to present my seminar on the topic, Fungal Diversity of Library 
and effect of plant extracts on book deteriorated fungal species. Next, ma'am. As we all know, library is the only place where we keep our important books and many other things for the long duration. Many microorganisms comes inside the library through the visitors from outside air current and deteriorate our important library books, papers, and the other materials also. So the aim of this study was to evaluate the effect of the leaf extract of some plants against some isolated fungal species from the deteriorated books in the libraries. I have selected five college libraries of the Varda city for this work and methanol and chloroform solvent was used for the succulent extraction. So methanol and chloroform extract of the selected plant species were screened in vitro for their antifungal activity against some book deteriorated fungal species. 15 species belonging to the nine genera were isolated and identified from the infested books in the library. So, alvan extract of the leaves of Azadirecta indica, Calistemon citronus, Eucalyptus lanceolatus, and Fungamia pinnata was tested against some dominant fungal species. Out of the 15 isolated species, these dominant species are Chitomium spiralis, Alternaria alternata, Aspergillus flavus, Aspergillus niger, Aspergillus fumigatus, and the Rhizopus tolonifer. Ma'am, next. These are the photographs of some deteriorated uh, books from which I have isolated the fungi. And on the right hand side, these are the names of the isolated fungal species followed by their colors on the books. These uh, species are Alternaria, Alternata, Aspergillus flavis, Aspergillus flavus, Aspergillus fumigatus, Aspergillus niger, Ketomium globosum, Ketomium funicola, Ketomium spiralis, Cladosporium cladosporides. Carvularia lunata, Fusarium oxysporum, Penicillium chrysogenum, Rhizopus tolonifer, Trichoderma species, etc. Next, ma'am. Then there are two methods which I used for the isolation of the fungi from the damaged books materials. The first one is the direct observation method, and the second one is the cotton swab method. In the direct observation method, the molds present on the books or the papers were taken off on the slides with sterilized needles and were stained with the lactophenol cotton blue and then observed under the microscope. And in the cotton swab method, the sterilized cotton swabs were gently rubbed over the affected areas of the papers and or the books and then pressed on the sterilized petri plates containing the potato dextrose agar and the sapectos agar media with the dissolved streptomycin to exclude the bacterial colonies. The plates were sealed with the paraffin tapes and kept for the four to five days in the biological incubator at 28 degrees Celsius to allow the fungal growth and were regularly examined. Next ma'am. These are some photographs of the petri plate showing the fungal growth of the isolated fungal species. Next ma'am. Then these are some photographs of the pure cultures of the fungal species isolated from the deteriorated books and was used for the antifungal activity. Next ma'am. Then these are some photographs of the, these are some microscopy photographs of the isolated fungi from the deteriorated books. Next ma'am. Here in this slide on the top of we can see the photographs of four plants, which I have selected for the antifungal activity. These plants are as a direct indica, eucalyptus, lanceolotus, calisthemon, citronus, and fungamia pinnata. First of all, I have collected the leaves of the plants, these plants, and collected plants leaves were washed thoroughly and shed dried. After complete drying, leaves were grounded to fine powder and with the help of the mixer grinder, and then percolate through the double layered muslin cloth and were used for the preparation of the solvent extracts. As I have told earlier, for the extraction, methanol and chloroform solvents were used. After the extraction, extracts were filtered through the water and filter paper one. Then all the extracts was evaporated to dryness under the reduced pressure at 40 degrees Celsius in the oven. And we can see in the slide, I have, uh, I have preserved these extracts at the 5 degrees Celsius in airtight brown glass bottles for the further use. Antifungal activity assay was done by the poison food technique in which 5 mm mycelial discs 
of the uh, previously maintained seven day old cultures of the test fungi were cut with the sterilized cork borer and transfer aseptically in the center of the petri plates maintaining the media and incubated at the 25 degrees celsius for the seven days then the percentage of inhibition of the mycelial growth was calculated and i have used clotrimazole as a standard for the antifungal activity then this slide showing this table showing the results which i have I obtained after the antifungal activity against some dominated books deteriorated fungi here you can see the methanol extract of all the four plant materials exhibited maximum efficiency than the chloroform extract for preventing the growth of most of the tested fungi among the plant extract tested methanol extract of the calistoma cytona showed the most promising antifungal activity against the aspergillus flavors having percentage inhibition growth of the 45 percent and methanol extract of the eucalyptus lanceolata showed the 68.54 percent inhibition activity was the only plant extract which could totally inhibit the growth of the ketomian spiralis the strong inhibitory activity of the methanol extract of eucalyptus lanceolata that is 24.28% against the rhizopus tolonifer was also noticed in this case alternaria alternata chloroform extract of the eucalyptus lanceolata showed the 47.33% inhibition growth and was more effective than the rest of the plant extracts but all these plant extracts were failed to show much considerable antifungal activity against the aspergillus fumigatus and the aspergillus niger however these plant extract exhibited moderate activity against the aspergillus flavors as ketomian spiralis rhizopus tolonifer and the alternaria alternata next one then these are the some photographs of the uh, showing the growth of the ketomium spiralis against both the solvent extract that is the methanol and the chloroform extract here you can see in the last petri plates i have used clotrimazole as a positive control so there is no growth of the fungus ketomium spiralis in the last petri plate and in the previous two petri plates plain methanol and the chloroform solvent was used as a negative control which showed maximum growth than that of the plant extracts which i have used during this work next one these are some photographs of the uh, growth of alternaria alternata against the both the solvent extracts next one these are some photographs of growth of aspergillus flavors against solvent extracts here you can also see the positive impact of the positive and the negative uh solvents next one then these are some photographs of the growth of the rhizopus tolonifer against the solvent extracts both the solvent extracts next one uh I, these slides i have already concluded so next one so here uh, i am ending my seminar topic thank you thank you so much everyone Thank you, Swapna, madam. Thank you, ma'am. Last two participants, Dr. Vivek sir and Ms. Nehal. Dr. Vivek sir, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Please start. Respected Dr. Inim Dungarwar, sir, Dr. Dharmik, madam, and the participants present over there, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, I am Dr. Vivek Narkhedkar, and I am going to talk about the topic indirect androgenesis and development of haploids in Catheranthus rosias. Uh, this is the part of this is a very preliminary part of my research work which I did at the very beginning of my research topic. Now, let's come to the introduction. Here, uh, let's understand the word androgenesis. Androgenesis is the development of haploid plants via anther or pollen culture. 
Now, when we go for anther and pollen culture, there is a probability that directly the explant will give rise to embryoids or it will give rise to a callus. And after that, we can go for plant regeneration. Now, when we culture pollen grains and on that, there is a development of embryoids and that embryoids will give rise to a haploid plant that is direct endogenesis. Other than this, all other facts, they are indirect endogenesis. By all other means, if the pollen grains are cultured, they give callus and from the callus by organogenesis, we develop the plants, it is indirect. And in this image, as you, as you can see, if we culture anther and from the anther, there's a development of embryoids and from the embryoid, there's a development of haploid plants, then it is indirect as well as from the anther, if there is a development of callus and from the callus, there is by organogenesis, there is a development of haploid plant, then it is also indirect androgenesis. Next, please. Now, these are the consequences and advantages of androgenesis or androgenic haploid development. The first and foremost important androgenic, androgenic haploid induction importance is the establishment of homozygous lines. And other than this, all other three, there are consequences of development of establishment of homozygous lines. That you can see here, shortening of breeding period, early expression of recessive genes, and the production of double haploids. All these three, they are the consequences of establishment of homozygous lines. Next, please. Now, to begin with the experiment, what we have to do, first, we have to go for cytological investigation. By cytology, I mean, unlike other tissue culture practices, we cannot generally go to directly plants, pick up any plant part and go and culture. Here, while doing androgenesis, first, we have to select a perfect stage of microscope development. And that perfect stage of development is a uninuclear stage of development. If you look at the bird size of the Ancathranthus roseus here, the bird size from C to F, now this bird size from 7 mm to 19 mm, it represents a perfect stage of uninucleate microspore development. If we culture microspore at this point, then only it will give rise to a perfect haploid plant. Next, please. Now, in other protocols, I have selected a neutron media. Uh, there is a general high media as MS media, which is universally accepted. And I also tried a bivera anther culture kit without any manipulation. I have manipulated MS media, but bivera anther culture kit was not manipulated. Now, in the culture conditions, uh, the established fact is that for anther culture, we need a complete dark period. But I have also tried a general tissue culture practice that is maintaining. 16 hour light and 8 hour dark period. Now come to pretreatment. Just like the uninucleus stage of development, this is another most important part of androgenesis. That is pretreatment of anther. Because we know the natural behavior pathway of pollen is to go for gametophytic development. That means go for sexual reproduction. But here we are trying to force or trying to stress out that pollen or microscope to develop into a haploid plant. So that means we are giving it a stress and that stress in the form of pretreatment. So there are various kinds of pretreatment that can induce or that can force the microscope to develop into a haploid plant or to go by sporophytic development. And that pretreatment is a cold, heat shock, polyethylene glycol, mannitol or centrifugation. I have used all these four. And in explant preparation, by explant preparation, I mean surface sterilization, I used Mercury chloride, ethanol, and distilled water. Next, please. Now, while culturing, at first I cultured the pretreated anthers. I also tried a various range of admissible 2,4-D uh, range that is from 1 mg per liter to 10 mg per liter. Then, whatever the embryoids I got uh, on the callus by culturing, I cultured those embryoids for the development of haploid plants. Later on. I checked the floidy status of the calli and the leaflets. And later on, I statistically analyzed the data for its validity. Next, please. Now, what I got, as you can see in the first graph, uh, this graph represents the percentage of response uh, obtained uh, when I cultured the anthers in a complete dark condition. For the detailed experimental design, you can see at the below, uh, below the slide, I just explained the findings. 
and the middle graph it represents the 16 hour light plus dark condition and the third graph it represents the anther culture in a bio era culture kit so out of these three condition when i selected nutrient media and culture condition i found that the complete dark period is required and the modified semi medium is uh, superlative as compared to other two next please Now, these are the successive stages in anthogenic haploid induction. First, in the diagram here, you can see a cultured anther, which is now induced to develop a callus, then a progrential development of callus, and the matured callus in the last image. Next, please. Now, let's talk about the pretreatment of anthers. Now, here, as you can see, I tried two combinations of each pretreatment, and the control condition was also there. Now, of that, I found that the cold pretreatment at 8 degrees Celsius for 10 days was very significant for the development of, for the induction of haploids, that is, culture of callus. And the other details about the experimented, experimental design is given at the below. Next, please. Now, these are the ranges of 24D, which I used for the haploid induction from 1 mg per liter to 10 mg per liter and there is a two combination at every uh, concentration of 24D. That uh, concentration is given there, experimental design is also given on the slide. Uh, here I observed that this 7 mg per liter concentration where NAA was uh, 0.5 mg per liter and BAP was 1.5 mg per liter, that concentration is very much essential for the induction of Callus in Catheranthus rosius anther culture. Next, please. Now, this is the case for shoot regeneration. What I did uh, while culturing all this, I got uh, callus, and on the callus, there is a development of some embryoid light structure, or you can say embryoids. Then I collected those embryoids and cultured them for plant regeneration. Now here, as you can see, the red and yellow bars that represent the percentage of shoot induced. And on that shoot induced, the blue and yellow color bar represents the percentage of shoot regenerated. The number one to one represents the control condition and two to 13, it represents the various uh, kind of hormonal combinations. But here you can see the percentage of shoot induced was uh, much higher as compared to the shoot regenerated. I differentiated shoot induced from the root, root shoot regenerated by the fact that shoot induced means development of green coloration, bifurcation of uh, apex. And when I say shoot regeneration, I mean that uh, the actual leaf like structure development or the leaf development. As you can see, the shoot induction percentage was much higher as compared to shoot regeneration. Other details are given here. Next, please. These are the um, shoot regenerated in Catheranthus rosius after culturing the embryoids derived from the callus. Next, please. Now, when I did ploidy analysis, I randomly selected 30 calli samples, of which I found that 80% of the calli samples were haploid, uh, about 7% were mixed ploid, and about 13% were diploid in nature. And furthermore, when I selected randomly 10 leaf samples of the regenerated plantlets, all this shows a haploid status. Next, please. Now, in conclusion, I could say that the present investigation concludes that the best nutrient combination for androgenesis in Catheranthus rosius is the MS media and it requires a complete dark period. Now, androgenesis is principally requires dark period and in case of pretreatment, it needs uh, 10 days pretreatment at 8 degrees Celsius. And the least influential pretreatment was centrifugation. And the best 2,4-D combination was 7 mg per liter. And also, the significant aspect of this plant is that it shows a higher potential for haploid development. And with respect to the protocols which are performed in this presentation, I can say that 
there is a need of establishing a stable culture after this preliminary protocol i did many experiments and i concluded that yes it is possible to develop but with respect to this much protocol there is a requirement of establishment of uh, stable culture and we need to do some more experiment next please these are the references utilized in this presentation next please and thank you thank you sir thank you good work dr vivek thank you sir Uh, sir, our today's last presenter is Miss Snehal. Snehal. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we are on time. Yeah. Yes, sir. We are on time. Yeah. Yes. Snehal. Uh, Snehal, ma'am, Navin wala kya hai sir na? How of Jamie Aaj patrol hai the? Yes. Yes, madam. Please start. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening, respected Dr. Dongarwar, sir, Dr. Preeti, ma'am, and all respected teachers. Myself, Snehal Bandakkar. I am assistant professor at Arts, Commerce, and Science College, Maregao. And my topic of today's seminar is Melisopelanological Studies of Honey Sample Collected from Varora of District Chandrapur, Maharashtra. Next slide, ma'am. As we know that palynology is the study of pollen grains and spores of algae, fungi, bryophytes and pteridophytes. Uh, there are various branches of palynology and one of them is melisopelanology. Melisopelanology is an applied branch of palynology, deals with the study of pollen grains which are found in honey sample and its wide application in apiculture. Next slide, ma'am. Uh, now, question comes, why to study melisopelanology? The pollen analytical study of honey can provide a basis for identifying the origin of honey in terms of its locality and its floral source. It could be a best method to determine plant used by bee as a source of nectar and pollen. Also, the plant provide pollen and nectar is very important for existence, colony spread, production and productivity of honeybee colony and setting epic. Here is also the company uh, composition of minor constitution of honey varies with location uh, with the nectar sources and also with different climatic conditions. The diversity of the physical and chemical properties of honey, like its color, its flavor, its moisture, content of protein and sugar, everything depends on the nectar and pollen of the original plant. So uh, this present work aims to provide information of resource of plants, bees, based on pollen morphological characters. Next slide, ma'am. Botanically, honey is of two types, unifloral and multifloral. Unifloral honey is the honey which contains pollen grain of one taxa. It uh, can also be called as monofloral honey. And in our India, orange blossom honey from Meghalaya is very famous. And worldwide, Manuka honey, uh, which is obtained from New Zealand and Australia, is very famous. Uh, it uh, costs near about 6,000 per uh, 500 grams. Whereas multifloral honey is the honey which contains pollen grains of various taxa. Uh, example, like Sundarban honey, which contains pollens of all the different plants. Next slide, ma'am. Now, what is the role of pollen grains in honey? Honeybee and flowering plants have been considered as an example of coevolution and mutualism, uh, where plant provide nectar and pollen to the plant, uh, honeybee, sorry, while honeybee, while wandering from one plant to another plant, pollinate them. But sometimes what happens, uh, bees are compelled to forage on poisonous plant, which they generally avoid, and these process could lead to honey toxicity. Pollens can be in, uh, incorporated in number of ways into the honey hives by bee itself uh, through air current mechanically by bee uh, keeper while extraction. But generally what happened, uh, bee carry only those pollens which are nutritionally very rich and reject those which are unsuitable for their consumption. Next slide, ma'am. Okay, now these are the pollen morphological character, aperture pattern, shape of pollen grain, surface of pollen grain, pollen grain size, and colpe size. 
these morphological character through which we one can identify to which taxa that pollen grains belong aperture pattern is the region uh, of the exine actually pollen grain consists of two uh, layer first one is the exine and innermost layer is intine so exine layer where it becomes thick thinner and softer through which germ tube can protrude out so distinguishable features between monocot and dicot is that in monocot it consists of only one germ pore that is called is mono uh, call it if it is called by and pore so it is called as monoporate whereas in dicotyledon uh, three germ tube uh, protrude out which is called as triculpate so uh, again uh, the shape of pollen grains uh, edmund classified different types of shape based on uh, ratio between polar axis and equatorial axis so this is this could be an important character from taxonomic point of view for formulations of key also and uh, surface of pollen grain that is called as exine ornamentation this is also in one of the important character for identification uh, point of view uh, th there are total 12 to 13 different types of exine ornamentations like uh, silate echinate fabulate pitate vaculate uh, these could help in identification of pollen grains uh, next is pollen grains as it very species to species and also depends on the kind of pollinator uh, come from uh, come for pollinations and uh, colpis size is very difficult to determine it requires lots of handling so i have not gone into that much detail uh, next slide ma'am okay this is the international commission uh, for bee honey uh, which suggests that there must be 200 to 300 grams of pollen of nectariferous plants uh, should be counted and uh, its frequency class can be determined by if the amount of pollen grain exceeds 45% in the honey sample then it is said to be predominant if it is in between 16 to 45% uh, then it is uh, secondary pollen if it is below 16% then it is important minor and it, if if it is between 3% then it is said to be minor next slide ma'am sample collection um, all the samples were collected from different localities of varora that is my hometown total eight sample i had collected out of which the readings of two i have incorporated here uh, collected sample were stored in bottles and kept at uh, normal temperature next ma'am Okay, melitopelenological analysis includes sample preparation by dilution method where 10 gram of honey sample was diluted with 50 ml of warm water followed by centrifugation and supernatant was discarded and pellets were stored in 70% alcohol for further use. Microscopical analysis was done for light microscopy where pollen grains were mounted in stained glycerin jelly and followed by microscopic observations. Uh, photography and observations were made with the trinocular fluorescence micro uh, uh, spores, uh, microscope and pollen grain size uh, aperture pattern its exine uh, pattern all were identified with the help of relevant literature available the pollen type were identified at generic and species level and on the basis of pollen honey sample the honey were designated as whether it is belong to multifloral type of honey or unifloral type of honey uh, next ma'am next now this is a qualitative analysis of uh, for pollen content which shows nine plant were found to be identified from above explained morphological character their percentage was calculated on the basis of uh, number of pollen observed and total number of pollen uh, present there and their frequency class was determined next ma'am next ma'am yes uh, table 2 which is sample 2 uh, 13 plants were identified. Uh, likewise, their percentage was calculated on the basis of total number of pollen observed and their frequency class was determined. Next, ma'am. Okay, this is the quantitative analysis uh, of, honey pollen, uh, of honey for pollen content, which suggests that uh, how much amount of pollen could be present in honey samples in, in sample number one, three lakh sixty thousand four fifty pollens were present in five gram of sample of honey and in table two it was uh, found to be seven lakh ten thousand five fifty next ma'am yeah. yes ma'am yeah. hello hello continue, continue madam Has, uh, what happened sir continue career continue career 
yes ma'am now nah, okay these are the polar morphological uh, characters of each taxa actually these are the identifying character through which one can find out uh, to which plant uh, the pollen grains belong next ma'am next next ma'am please next next again okay these were uh, the photographs taken through light microscope and all the observations morphological observations made uh, based on this photographs obtained next ma'am total 18 uh, types of uh, pollen grains were found there okay these are the total observations and result next ma'am next ma'am Ma'am, conclusion slide is there. Yes, yes. A result and discussion is there, ma'am. Before uh, uh, conclusion. Yes, sir. Next. So, uh, pollen uh, grain found to be an essential tool in the analysis of honey, and in this investigation, total eighteen pollen types were identified according to their morphological character, which belongs to different families. And this present studies report suggests that multi-floral type of honey sample uh, found in both the sample. Next, ma'am. Conclusion. uh the morphological character of pollen grain is an important tool to know the resource plant visited by bee for nectar and pollen collection these a uh, pollen analytical study provide information about the resource of bee also the pollen grain from honey can be used for taxonomic identification of honey yielding plant and analysis of honey sample for pollen spectrum beside enabling to inform the botanical source of honey and also know its geographical source it's also aid for better identification and classification on pollen type and to classify the honey samples in different groups like whether it belongs to multifloral or unifloral and this knowledge of plant visited by bee is essential in guiding prospective beekeeper in the choice of suitable sites for locating apiaries okay okay uh, next ma'am the next uh, will be references okay thank you these thank are the references so. thank, yeah. thank you thank you so much uh, snail madam nice work actually thoda laborious tha but acche se explain kiya aapne and it was a nice study dongar sir any comment on the presentations uh, thank you very much dear colleagues that we have completed uh, all the eight uh, seminars which were scheduled today uh, within time uh, i must be thankful to you uh, because uh, uh, you have probably uh, stayed uh, Calm during the technical glitches, uh, which we faced during the the second afternoon session, and uh, I have requested uh, uh, Professor Tirke sir that he will be continuing his lecture tomorrow, and if the time permits, then he will shift to the second lecture, and he, probably he will be sending uh, his PPT uh, to HRDC's mail so that uh, uh, Madam can handle. Uh, from her end so that uh, we hope that tomorrow uh, there will not be any technical problems and uh, uh, today uh, though we have started very late but uh, we have started probably before time uh, mm -hmm. as per my watch it is uh, uh, 55 past 4 so we have completed all the eight seminars on time yes so i also request uh, tomorrow's participants on tomorrow's uh, i will not say participants but my <laughs> colleagues uh, to be uh, on time tomorrow uh, please maintain timing as far as uh, your seminar is concerned though you are presenting 10 slides 20 slides 25 slides or 30 slides please see that you are completing your seminar within 10 minutes thank you very much thank you so much sir thank you all of you thank you एंड uh, अभी देखिए आज का जो रिपोर्ट सबमिशन है फर्स्ट सेशन का तो आप कर सकते हैं सेकंड सेशन में अगर कुछ चीजें आपको नहीं सुनाई दी होगी या तो कुछ जो भी अपना टेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम था तो सेकंड सेशन का रिपोर्ट नहीं बनाया तो भी चलेगा या तो अगर आप लोग बना सकते हैं आपके तरफ से कुछ इश्यू नहीं होगा तो यू कैन प्रोसीड फॉर द रिपोर्ट सबमिशन ऑफ सेकेंड सेशन अदरवाइज फर्स्ट सेशन का किया तो वेद एन गुड नो प्रॉब्लम ठीक है हैंड रिटर्न रिपोर्ट भी चलेगा ना हाँ हैंड रिटर्न को आप स्क्रीनशॉट लेके वो अटैच कर सकते हैं 
उद्या मी सकाळी फ्रेश माइंड नी सगळ्या गोष्टी सांगते आता सगळेच एक्झॉस्ट झाले असतील माझं लॅपटॉप पण एक्झॉस्ट झालाय सकाळी साडेसहा पासून सुरू आहे ते हँग व्हायचं याच्यावर आहे मी याला तुरंत पहिले सेव्ह करते या मीटिंगला नाही तर हे पण चाललं जाईल ठीक आहे चला उद्या भेटू उद्या भेटू सकाळी पावणे सात वाजता चला थँक्यू ऑल ऑफ यू थँक्यू मॅडम